if we want to find um, the component of the tangential component of acceleration and the normal component of acceleration for a helix, then we can remember that the tangential acceleration is just the derivative of speed with respect to time. That makes sense because tangential acceleration is speeding up or slowing down, right? So you're seeing how is the speed changing. Um, a sub n, we remember, is kappa times the speed squared, but it's hard to find the curvature. That usually takes some time. And so usually it's faster to find, um, to find this, the square root of the length of the acceleration squared minus a sub t squared. So usually we find a sub t, and then we find the acceleration. We find the length of the acceleration and square it, and then subtract a sub t squared and take the square root. So let's see how this would work in this case for finding a sub t. So our first thing is to find the speed, right? So, well, first thing is to find the velocity so we can find the speed. The velocity would be the derivative of position with respect to time, which is 3 cos t minus 3 sine t and 4. And we've done this before. The speed in this case is 9 cos squared plus 9 sine squared. That's 9 plus 16. Got a little hasty there. That would be the square root of 25, which is 5. So our speed in this case is 5. And a sub t would be the change in speed. In this case, the speed is constant, so a sub t is 0. We're not accelerating at all tangentially. We're not speeding up or slowing down. We're going along at a constant speed. Now we can find a sub n. So to do that, we have the velocity already. Let's find the acceleration. The acceleration would be r double prime of t, right? Or that would be v prime of t. And we've already calculated v, so we, v prime would be minus 3 sine t, uh, minus 3 cos t, and 0. And therefore, um, the acceleration, let's see, yeah, OK. And so the length of the acceleration squared, normally to find, to find length, we take the square root, but we're going to square it. So we won't need the square root. So we'll have 9 sine squared t plus 9 cosine squared t um, plus 0, which is 9. So finally, we can find a sub n. a sub n is going to be the square root of the magnitude of the acceleration squared, which is 9, minus a sub t squared, which is 0. So we get the square root of 9, which is 3. So in this case, our ex the magnitude of the acceleration was 3. And all of that acceleration is normal acceleration because there was no tangential acceleration. OK. so. Going along this helix, that makes sense, right? Because as we go along the helix, we're moving at a constant speed. The only acceleration we have is the kind of acceleration that is turning us. We don't have any speeding up or slowing down at all. And so remember, to turn requires a force, and force is mass times acceleration. So to turn also requires an acceleration. Another example for us to do. OK, so remember a sub t, the component of the acceleration in the tangent direction, is the change in speed. How much are you speeding up or slowing down on the curve? In this case, um, the velocity is 1. And the derivative of the natural log of the cosine is minus sine over cosine, so minus tan t and 3. So the speed. The magnitude of the velocity, which would be the square root of 1 plus tangent squared t, which we've discussed is the secant of t, because um, 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared. And so then to find a sub t, we just take the derivative with respect to t of the secant of t, which is the secant tangent. So we get secant t tangent t. Now we do have tangential acceleration, right? And that changes over time. But we are speeding up or slowing down along this curve as time goes on. So we have a variable a sub t. Now to find a sub n. a sub n, of course, is kappa speed squared. But finding kappa is usually hard. So instead of doing that, 
we're going to find the square root of the magnitude of the acceleration squared minus a sub t squared. Now to find the magnitude of the acceleration squared, first we need to find the acceleration. But fortunately, we've already found the speed, so we just take the derivative. Uh, or we've already found the velocity, so we just take the derivative of the velocity to get the acceleration. The derivative of 1 is 0. Oh, I made a strange mistake here. When I found the velocity, the derivative of 3 is 0. So I was okay when I calculated the speed because I forgot about that 3. Sort of two errors, two wrongs made a right. Okay, let's see the acceleration would be the derivative of 1, which is 0. The derivative of the tangent is the secant squared, so we get minus secant squared t. And then finally, um, the derivative of 0 is 0. So there's my acceleration. Um, so the magnitude of the acceleration is going to be equal to the square root of secant to the fourth, right? which would just be secant squared t. OK, now that I have the acceleration, I can use this formula to find um, a sub n. a sub n is going to be the square root of the magnitude of the acceleration squared. If you square secant squared, you get secant to the fourth minus a sub t squared. We already figured out that a sub t was secant t tangent t, so we have minus secant squared t tan squared t. If we factor out a secant squared, we have secant squared t minus tan squared t. OK. And let's see, 1 plus the tangent squared is equal to the secant squared. So if you take the tangent squared away from both of those both sides, you find that 1 is the secant squared minus the tangent squared. So it's just a Pythagorean identity that secant squared minus tangent squared is 1. So we have the square root of secant squared t, <clears throat> which is, since we're in this range where secant is positive, this is technically the absolute value of the secant of t, but if the secant is positive, the absolute value doesn't do anything, and so we have secant t. So a sub t is secant t tan t. The component of acceleration in the normal direction is equal to the secant of t.